Is that is that Zoom that changed it? Zoom changed it. Yeah. So when Zoom changes something, I have to like I, I have to double check. I'm getting better at it. It's been a couple of weeks now. So so All welcome right. everyone. Friday afternoon. Matt Wheeler's here with us. Matt, show us your socks. <laughs> so I have two options because I'm almost almost sure that I showed you these pair already recently. But I was gonna make sure real quick. So did I show you the surfboarding dinosaurs with the volcano? I saw dinosaurs, but are are they the same? Do you have more than you have more than one? Oh, I have more. No, than I one. did not see those. I saw. You didn't the, see yeah. these? Okay, I, so these. I, I did not see the surfboarding. So you have surfboarding dinosaurs with like the volcano going on, and like. Yeah, like I just think that I, when I've had dinosaur socks lately and I'm really enjoying them. There you go. And like, and like surfboarding dinosaurs, how cool is that? It is cool. What more could you ask for? So. All right, well then I'll save yeah. I'll save the I'll save the other pair for another time. Yeah. Because I I seriously brought another pair just in case because I was like, oh, I got I can't give Tammy two two socks. I, and I it was dinosaurs, but I I recall other dinosaurs, so I'm, yeah, I'm going to go with it wasn't. And otherwise, I just enjoyed those again anyway. So there you go. So so <laughs> oh, that's really funny. So what you got for us today? Um, so it's, it's interesting because sometimes I feel like I want to, like, I think it would be healthy to talk about this more, but I get nervous that like, maybe, maybe people are too early in recovery when they're watching this, <clears throat> but maybe you're not. And so I wanted to talk about, um, sexual health specifically, um, and, if anybody's ever heard of Doug Braun Harvey, he has the Harvey Institute and he created uh, the six principles of sexual health. Um, and I was just going to go through those six principles or maybe at least several of them. We'll see uh, before if we have any questions. Before you get started, I want to like, cause you said that this could be too early and, and I'm going like, I, I think so many people don't even know what sexual health is. And so you come into this crisis with, you know, discovery oh. and things like that. And, and, and an addict may be particularly uh, motivated to tell you that whatever they're doing is healthy sexually. So, so I, I think it is timely and, and with yeah. all of these things, take what you need and leave the rest. And, you know, if this isn't a good fit for you at this moment, but, but I think having a comprehension of what, you know, even asking the question, like can be useful. So I don't think it's, I, I think it's perfect. Well, and that's where I'm at. Like I work with enough people that it's hard because some people are brand new in their recovery journey and they're asking sexual health questions. Like, I mean, things as simple as, well, I don't know if I should be having sex because I just found out there's this issue going on. And so, and like suddenly I'm having maybe an intense sexual desire, but maybe it's bad if I express that. And, and it's, and, and so I find that people are all, all over the place. Some people, when this happens, if there's, if there's a sexual betrayal of, of some sort, they are they shut down um and as they shut down sexually some people become hypersexual like there's just so many very so much variance and a lot of times people are like well what's okay um or yeah. uh, another question i get all the time is well if my partner comes to me and says hey i'm triggered sexually and and asks me for sex is it bad to have sex with them and and, and I'm like, it's interesting because there's a wide range of answers in there. And, and I would say generally what I see is, or what I tell people generally is, um, are you going to feel something like energy being taken from you if you're sexual, right? Like, meaning, are you doing it to try and manage their emotion? That might not be the best reason to engage sexually, but if you're doing it because you're, you're basically like, Hey, I want to be sexual. I want to enjoy sex. I want to, uh, if they're telling me they're triggered, that's them being vulnerable. Um, and generally when you have, um, 
essentially two consenting adults who are wanting to be sexual with each other. Like, meaning if that's within your marital relationship or your, or I shouldn't say marital, your um, relational agreement between the two of you, then go ahead and have sex, like enjoy it, right? Regardless of where you're at on the journey. Um, if you have somebody, a lot of times sexual compulsivity is often defined by the disconnection from another person. And so they're, they're going to pornography instead of go, going to their partner. And so I'm often telling people like, if you both are comfortable with it, go for it. Like you're, you're not going to harm anything uh, per se, right? Like there are certain circumstances where if one of you doesn't feel willing or, or whatever, well, that's a lack of consent. Well, you don't want to engage without consent. The, in fact, that's um, uh, Doug, uh, Dr. Harvey's first principle of sexual health that he puts out is consent. Um, it, in order to have sexual health, it is required that sex be consensual. Um, and he, he, he postulates that that is the most universal sexual health principle on the planet, um, is that there is voluntary cooperation um, where we communicate permission and we try to reach sexual satisfaction and intimacy with, willing, with a willing partner. Um, and so that, that understanding of consent, um, makes it so that sex isn't intrusive or it's not violating, right? Um, the, or manipulative. Or manipulative, right? Um, <laughs> and, and, and the, the way that he describes it that I really like is that you don't establish consent once during a sexual experience in fact you're establishing consent throughout the experience uh, many times along the way um, you're establishing consent and this is why people who maybe have unhealthy an unhealthy understanding of of consent they might ask permission and it, like or ask for consent and they don't hear someone say no so then they're like oh i guess i'm good and it's like no like unless you have another person who is equally engaged uh and and it's and it's hard for me to exactly define this but i'll give you like one scenario for instance if if I reach to my partner and I say, hey, like, I, I'd really like being sexual. And they're like, you know what? Me too. Or, um, well, I'm not really in the mood, but I could get there, right? Like, that is mutual consent, right? And if at some point I get a vibe that I'm like, hey, something seems to have shifted, right? If my partner goes silent, if my partner is no longer giving me feedback, if they feel frozen, Right. I'm like, I'm backing off because a healthy. Somebody who understands healthy consent and healthy sexual boundaries is going to notice, generally notice the cues of their partner. And there are some exceptions to this, like somebody who's neurodivergent. My, um, so, for instance, like uh, be maybe autism spectrum. Right. They may not have the ability to notice the nonverbal cues as well as somebody else. Um, but, but ultimately during that experience, we're watching and observing and we're learning what consent looks like. And at any point, something seems off. We, we basically stop and check in and go, Hey, how are you doing? You know, and, and, and you know, are you still on board here? Are we still, you know, are we both still having the same experience per se? Right. Um, and and so I think too often people get it in their head like, and and I and an example of this that I've heard many times, and I think uh, Patrick Carnes in Out of the Shadows even shares this, where somebody who has sexual compulsivity might pull up to somebody else in a car, and feel like there's vibes, and next thing you know they're kind of chasing each other around town in a car, and in in. Uh, and out of the shadows, 
this this man in this instance realizes, oh my gosh, I'm not having the same reality that this person is because she just pulled up to a police station and ran inside. And then he speeds off with this weird idea of, I had no clue that she wasn't into me. He, he was unfortunately not picking up on the lack of consent vibes that were going on. And she felt stalked. And so one of the things that happens when we uh, potentially have out of control sexual behavior is that like we lose sight of understanding uh, what consent looks like. So it's really important for somebody who's learning to get into sexual integrity to start having conversations with their partner. Like, let's talk about consent and let's have a conversation around um, when, when has it not felt consensual for me? Uh, when has it felt consensual, right? Like, let, uh, what signs do, do I need to be looking for that are nonverbal that are a lack of consent? What signs are uh, a, a positive consent, if that makes sense. So um, this uh, essentially, and this was a piece I was already going back to, we almost are looking for when we reach to somebody to be sexual, we are reaching to them to give us back to some degree, the same excitement we're giving them. Now, I have to be careful because some people have what's referred to as, um, so you have spontaneous arousal, which is, I love Emily Nagoski because the way she says this, it's like a lightning bolt hits you as you're walking down the street and you're like, oh, I'm really aroused. I want to be sexual, right? Um, and like some people only have, um, responsive arousal and that's essentially that a lightning bolt never ever hits them they're never in the mood just spontaneously uh they have to have somebody who comes in and essentially sets the mood or they need to do something in their own life uh, for the like to create the mood for themselves if that makes sense and, and it's this intentional experience and but consent is the idea that I want this sexual experience to have an effect on me. I want it to change me, to give me something that I desire, and I want you to provide it for me, right? Like, and so I mean that's how that like that's a direct quote from from Doug. Uh there's been several times I've been quoting him as I've been speaking this, but like um, because I just want to make sure I give credit where credit's due. Um, but the idea is consent doesn't necessarily mean that we both have to be totally in the mood. It's that we both want to get each other in the mood and we want to have this experience together. Um, and one thing that I've seen a lot of times when you have somebody who has where their, uh, where their sexual behavior has been unhealthy is that they, they, they're not even sure of what that process looks like to get their partner in the mood like for them they're annoyed it's like I can't believe I have to do work here and it's like you know it's the it's the I can't believe I actually have to pull the ingredients out in order to bake a cake right and it, it's like no cake should just happen and it should happen the way that I think it should happen uh, and so one of the things they often have to learn is what is healthy consent and how do I actually create uh arousal in my partner if that makes any sense so to be honest we're at that 245 mark like we could just hit this today and go with questions from here and well i have a question before we move on but we don't have questions but like when because you talked about um you know back off and i thought you know like but back off with no judgment because you know because if i you know if you back off and you're like you know like what's wrong with you or whatever like oh. see, or you back off with poutiness. Oh, so, yeah. So, so I so I go to engage you sexually, and then and then I feel rejected, and then I'm, huh, well, see, you always do this, and you know you don't love me, and you don't care about, and then there's 
So that's one of the things he actually talks about where actually it's not him that talks about it. Um, I'd have to go look up the quote to get the author right, but essentially um, healthy sex is where there's no unwanted consequences. I think it was a quote from Emily Nagoski. No yeah. unwanted consequences. And that means that I can engage you sexually and I might be disappointed that, that you don't want to participate, but I'm not going to throw a fit and pout um, and like try and emotionally either manipulate you or whatever. It's that idea of I can back off and say, I'm disappointed, right? There's nothing wrong with being disappointed. There's nothing wrong with being a little sad. But if I'm going to use that sadness and disappointment to guilt trip my partner, talk about not having um, like the the sexual emotional awareness of how to actually like arouse and lure your partner, if that makes sense. Right. Mm -hmm. Because because most partners aren't like, oh, I feel guilt tripped and I feel like a ton of pressure. Wow. Now I'm in the mood. Like, yeah, I had no idea that all I needed was guilt and uh, pressure and poutiness. Boy, let me tell you how attractive that is. So just in case you guys can't hear it, there's tons of That's sarcasm. Sarcasm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So and, one and of the that, other, go ahead. That Please. requires emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. right? It requires emotional growth to get there. I don't know anybody who doesn't have to learn to develop that like experiencing sexual re rejection or disappointment who doesn't have to learn how to not have some level of maybe poutiness or disappointment like that's emotional intelligence that has to be developed the, the tough part is is we've been married 20 years we've been married 30 years we've been married 10 years and it's like and it's still going on on, you know, or and I and I shouldn't say married. We've been partnered for however long we are, and it's mm -hmm. still happening. It's like, hey, we need to work on the emotional intelligence here because why is there poutiness still going on? I, I was thinking Sorry, too when you're no, 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 please. But when you're talking about you know communicating, first of all, always challenging, but also like. When has it not fe felt consensual? And like, I was like, wow, that's, I mean, that's a really vulnerable thing to be able to share. You know, it didn't feel consensual to me, you know, and to like, like this is, re this will require like to do this well, you know, some emotional um, fortitude that I'm not going to take this personally, that it's just an attack on me. And it's also, I want our relationship to be better. So I'm willing to step into this really scary place, you know, on both sides of, you know, the relationship. Uh, and let me tell you, as a clinician, a very tenuous place that I often have to go with couples. And again, I mean, you guys know that couples are my thing. I love working with couples, but a very tenuous place I have to go is let's have a conversation about consent. Let's talk about when there's been a lack of consent but how and, and it takes a lot of emotional intelligence to be able to say, I want to know when it didn't feel consensual to you, but I don't have to take on the shame that I meant it to be unconsensual. Oh, great. Right. Point. Yeah. And that's a tough space to go because there are very hurt partners who have who have expressed to me before uh, whether they use the word directly a lot of times they'll soften it. They'll, they'll say, well, I felt raped or they'll said it felt rapey, right. Yeah. As a way of, and they'll, and they'll soften it. Well, it was rapey or it felt non-consensual. And when we hear that, we take it on and it's like, wait, you're telling me I'm a rapist or you're telling me that I raped you. And, it, and, and like, how dare you? And rather than realizing we could both be having an experience where you feel that it feels rapey, it feels non-consensual. And maybe I didn't have the wherewithal or the, or the realization to know that that's what you were experiencing. Maybe it wasn't in my, in my intention or template at all. Now, the mistake I would make is to try and defend myself and to suggest, um, is to suggest that, well, I didn't mean it that way. And so you shouldn't feel that way. That's absurd. 
I may not have meant it that way. And you still had that experience. And we're both right. If that makes sense. Like, yes, I don't have to own that label if my intention wasn't there, but I can totally feel sadness and I can feel embarrassed and even like appalled that you had that experience and that I was a partner in that. And, and, and that and I didn't have we... the emotional ability to identify that my partner is not feeling safe or part of this, you know, right. uh, uh, experience in a good way. And, and I've had partners who have said, I gave no indication. I, oh. Like, I, I didn't want, so I've had it all over the board, right? Oh, you can yeah. see it all sorts of fashions, like where somebody will say, oh. I need you to know that this is what it felt like, but I hit it. I buried it because... And then you can have a hundred different reasons why they gave no indication. I mean, somebody who was more emotionally attuned probably could have seen and gone, Hey, like you're not really actively participating or you're just, you know, a dead fish or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. But I hadn't thought about like that would hide the fact that it doesn't feel consensual, but it makes sense. I just hadn't you know, thought that through. So oh no it's this is what makes this topic so intriguing and also i love how you said it incredibly vulnerable right the, to to be able to have these conversations both people usually need to be pretty emotionally uh mature would just be the most simple way to say it so how often because i could see like it would be really beneficial to have a conversation in, with you like or with someone like you to help you know provide the safe space like like when would you recommend that this is done with the help of a qualified professional versus like trying to do this on your own um <laughs> so i mean it, it's tough because i have seen couples navigate it and have these conversations uh just like anything else uh, okay but but I would, but it's interesting because I would ask check your level of fear, and if oh, good you idea. are if you're too scared to do this conversation without feeling like it's gonna go completely sideways, um, then I you know I would for sure enlist a a professional's help. And I'll be honest, I'm you know I'm not certified yet, but I've been working on my sex therapy certification. Um, I, I would have a hard time encouraging anybody to just do this with any therapist, right? Like, Oh yeah. A qualified a of, professional. Yeah. yeah I'm, so. I'm not even, I'm not even certified and I'm, I'm, I still have a supervisor. I'm still learning. And, and, and I just say, I mean, even, and I, and I don't mean this in a bad way. Like I didn't get this training as a CSAT. Like I didn't get this training. I, agree. Until, I didn't get this training until I got into the, 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 process of becoming certified as a sex therapist which i have to remind everybody i am not yet certified <laughs> so but you're learning and you're but, working with a supervisor but i'm learning yeah 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 yeah, yeah. So, and yeah. so that's so i would either find somebody who's in the process of learning um or somebody who is uh asex certified for instance um you know, and, and I will tell you, those two camps don't always get along. Like, there's a lot of people. ICS who... does. Like, they get sex addiction and sex. So I refer to the the IICS uh, uh, trained therapist because they actually do they agree do that they're yeah, they're, it's really helpful because yep. you're right. It's it's both, and sometimes this first, then that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a it, it's a it's a fascinating area to go and I would just tell everybody like you know it's always best uh to consult with a professional because these conversations are are really difficult to do. Yeah, and I think it's really important, you know, if the goal is connection, how do we best navigate that? And I think it will be different for different couples. You know, and maybe part of the conversation we go, okay, we can go this far. Well, now we here's our sticking point, let's talk to a qualified professional. So the question that is in our uh, Q&A is about consent. So I'm going to read that one to you and then um if we don't have other questions, you can proceed with point 2. I'm the betrayed partner. I don't believe every single lie 
in a relationship negates otherwise consensual sex, but I feel like my ability to consent was stolen from me when the lies are significant like this. I know this is a common feeling from other partners in the groups. I have even uh, flat out told my now ex-partner that if there were physical betrayals with others that weren't disclosed, my consent would not be valid. He knowingly violated my consent. At what point does this go beyond sex addiction into offender behavior? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, I will tell you that this is not an easy question to answer. Um, I've been in trainings where I've had people suggest that anybody who is involved in sex addiction has to own some level of sexual offense. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't always know where I stand in such a strong statement. Um, but I will say this, one of the sexual health, uh, concepts that I absolutely love is the understanding of relational agreements. And what that means is that in the relationship that I'm in, what have we agreed to? What have we talked about? What are we both okay with? And, and it's interesting because um, I'll say it this way. I, I have come, me personally, from a much more conservative background in the way that I've lived my life. And, um, and it, it's been an interesting process, process to get an education, not only as a therapist, but as a sexual health professional, realizing that I, I, it's not good for me to put my judgment on everybody else, on other couples or whatever. And so I've had to, I've had to learn um, to, when I'm talking to clients, like how do I open them up and get them to start talking about their relationship and what they want or what they um, have agreed to and, and does it work for them? And so, uh, so let's say somebody says to me, um, well, when I'm talking to a couple, one, they both might have a conversation and say, Hey, uh, I'm okay with, if there's masturbation in the relationship, uh, as long as, you know, I, I don't like the idea of porn being involved and, and another person in the relationship say, might be like, well, why, what's the issue with porn? But now we're having a conversation and we're working out together what our agreements are. One of the problems and I would argue one of probably one of the biggest problems when there is a, a sense of sexual betrayal is that most of the time we've never talked about what our sexual agreements are, right? It's we go into a relationship with general assumptions. Oh, we were both raised uh, religiously and therefore, you know, sex outside of our relationship um, you know, we both just know that that's not okay. And, and that, and that might be absolutely true that that was the unspoken relational agreement, or it might be completely spoken. Well, when somebody says to me, I feel like I engaged sexually without my consent, I look at that and go, yeah, because whether the agreement was spoken or unspoken, you knew what you were okay with, meaning uh, if there are if there are physical uh, sexual experiences outside of our relationship and then without me knowing and then I uh, was asked to engage sexually with my partner who I was under the impression was faithful to me only or, or sexual with me only well then yes that is going to feel non-consensual because you know at the very least you're bringing in to the sexual experience, somebody else that we have, haven't talked about, even if they're not physically in this room, there's an openness to potential, you know, sexually transmitted, you know, uh, infection or whatever else, right? Like, so there's, and that's just one small reason why there would be like this breaking of consent. And so, but but let's say that's it's not even physical. I've had a lot of people say, well, if I knew that they were looking at porn, I wouldn't have engaged sexually. And, 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 and then I'll start to explore, well, why is that? And they might be like, well, um, because I don't know what they're 
bringing into our relationship that they saw there and that I'm being influenced by perhaps, and I didn't know about. And it's like, okay, that's fine. Um, I, I can see why that bothered you. So I have to spend time to help people understand like, what is it about this that feels non-consensual? And you're, you have absolutely a right to that feeling. Um, now what I'm going to suggest is moving forward with your, your, either your current sexual partner or your next sexual partner or, or any in the future is let's, let's talk about all of our relational agreements. What are the things that I know I'm not okay with that, you know, you're not okay with, and what are the things you are okay with? And what are the things I'm okay with? And like, let's have a very thorough conversation and maybe even on a somewhat regular basis to make sure that we're still in agreement um, so that we are less likely to have that sense of betrayal. Um, so the truth is, to answer this question maybe a little more succinctly, um, anytime we let somebody else know what our need is and we feel that and and even if we let them know that need indirectly, we are going to feel offended when they seemingly go against what they knew was our need. So when you ask, at what point does this go beyond sex addiction into offender behavior? I won't give you an official definition of what offender behavior is, because there are therapists who are 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 actually trained in sex offender work, which I have yeah, never... Yeah, there's a legal I, definition for it. There so, is yeah. a legal definition. Yeah, yeah. However, to the to, in the sense that you feel offended because I had a need and a bound like a need and a boundary are the same thing. I had a need that this boundary not be violated or that this need be provided. And when you knowingly went against that, that feels offensive to me, and I feel offended against. Right. And so I go, well, it makes sense. That's when it's offender behavior. If you're going to ask me, when does somebody transition from being a sex addict to a sex offender? Not my realm to comment on, but I would say honor that feeling that if it feels offensive to you, it's because it was. So I don't know if that was way too much information or if that helped answer the question. I hope that 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 helps you. Yeah, I, you know, and people use those terms and because there's a legal definition of what sex offender is, I'm incredibly careful. The behaviors, absolutely abusive, offensive, hurtful, betrayal. I mean, like just awful, you know, um, uh, but, but a le you know, the legal definition of sex offender, it, you know, it, I mean, and many addicts are not legal sex offenders you, you know and if they are call the police you know because that's you know that you know that that is a completely different thing and you're right like when people you know are looking for help for sex offense you know i'm referring to other just like you're talking about there's sex addiction there's sexual health and sex therapists there's also sex offender that are working with you know with the the people that have the left legal definition of offense so so we have time and we don't have another question. So you want to go to point two? Like this may be a multi-part sure. part. Yeah. Well, which goes right in line with actually what we were talking about is that the, the principle of sexual health number two is non-exploitative. Um, in order to have healthy sex, it has to, it requires it to be non-exploitative. And this one is interesting because the way that, uh, it's defined ex as exploitation is when a person leverages their power or control to receive sexual gratification. And so if you think about this, um, let's just maybe look at this from like a, a marital situation, right? Or, or sorry, uh, uh, I say a marital, like I won't get into like child abuse or right. uh, like the, like the abuse of like, uh, somebody who probably would fit the definition of a sex offender, which would be like uh, Henry Weinstein, Weinstein. Or Harvey whatever Weinstein. Guy's I, but Harvey, I was thinking hashtag, right. hashtag me too is a right. perfect example where there's right. power, 
you know, where there's power. a power differential, meaning, you know, I, I, I essentially have the ability to make or break your career. Um, and, and, and therefore I have a power differential over you. And there's a, there's a lot of them. I actually read, uh, the book by Ronan, uh, Farrow, and it is phenomenal where he documents the, the whole investigation process of, 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 the, uh, Harvey Weinstein, Harvey, Henry. Yes. Harvey. No, it's Harvey. Yeah. Harvey. Yeah. Uh, Harvey. Weinstein. And, and, uh, and I, I mean, it was fascinating to start to see that power differential. And I'll tell you, um, it, it is it is an amazing thing to realize how often power differentials occur. And we just don't even think about, about them. Um, and it's terrible because there's a lot of exploitation that can occur and, and we might not even realize there's exploitation. Um, I mean, whether it's a, a college professor and a student, whether it's a, a boss and an employee, right? You have situations like that that are obviously exploitative. Um, but when we're talking about like, let's say uh, two people who are peers, you know, a husband and wife or similar type of a relationship, right? Husband, husband, wife, wife, however, however the, the, mm -hmm. the relationship is. Exploitation can come in other ways. I, I remember being a kid, I was home sick one day from school and I watched like, I was flipping through the channels back when you had like six channels, you know? And I swear I, it was probably some silly daytime talk show like, uh, uh, I don't know, Maury Povich or something silly like that, right? I was trying to think of the other guy who was like throwing Jerry. Jerry Springer. Yeah, yeah there you go. And I remember one that, that that I was, you know, I didn't, I probably didn't stay on it very long because I was like, I trying to find cartoons or something. But I, but I mean, I, I remember them being this person who was like, uh, yeah, I have a deal with my spouse where we have sex X number of times a week. And then um, anytime after that, she earns, you know, 20 bucks a, a time or something uh -huh. like that. And I remember, I remember as a kid just going, well, that's weird. Like, what is that? Well, interestingly enough, as a clinician at this point, I'm, it would be like, does that work for the two of you? Like, are you both okay with that? Right now, if, if the, in that case, the wife is like, well, no, like I have to do this in order to survive. I don't feel like, you know, I, I'm home with the kids and he doesn't give me enough money for whatever we need. And so I have to do this. Well, then that would be a form of exploitation, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, so when we start looking at our uh, relationship, we look and go, OK, have we removed exploitation out of it? And um. Let's see here. So one of the things um, he talks about is that you often have to sit and work with a couple to find out, um, is there exploitation going on that may maybe you guys didn't even realize was happening? Um, and And something that's, you know, often like, outside the marital agreement, which we often will call like an affair or cheating, betrayal. Um, the exploitation is the cover up, the denial, oh. the pretending that this thing didn't happen. And what you're exploiting is the partner's trust. Mm. Right. And so think about this. Exploitation is happening. If um there is deception covering up what's gone on uh, because I'm now exploiting your trust. So, so a lot of our, if you will, betrayed partners are going to resonate with it did feel exploitative, right? Because they kept telling me, no, nothing ever happened. And, you know, I was just imagining things and it's really not, not what I think. And, and so I exploited the trust to continue the relationship, including continuing the sexual 
nature of the relationship. Um, and so that that is one way that exploitation occurs. Mm, that that's I, I, the financial was easy for me because I know I get the calls too, and I, you know that we're you, a, a common scenario: stay-at-home mom, you know, dependent on on this. And so, yeah, all it feels like to them that the control is, you know, with the breadwinner. And so, you know, what am I going to do? And so, you know, it is a power up, power down, you know, position then. Yep, absolutely. And, and then, it, I mean, that, that can even, you know, change in, in even, even if there is a divorce. I mean, uh, uh, I remember a phrase I heard as a kid is, you know, we'll all stop paying the child support, which is so messed up. And, I, yeah. you, know, you know, I remember hearing in response, oh, that's fine. I'll just call your probation officer. But most of the time you don't have that going on in a home where the power can be pulled back, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it is a challenge. And and I think like you talked about earlier too, with fear, it's like, you know, even the fear of that, even if the reality, it probably wouldn't happen, but the fear that it could, and gosh, then I'll be homeless with my children or whatever, you know? And so it's just easier to, you know, just, you know, do, you know, to give in. But again, it's not, you know, with the consent of like, gosh, we're both excited, you know, to be participating. So. Absolutely. Okay. So, so no, other go to po- go, no, I know go to point three. So we'll maybe this will be a two-parter three today and three next time. All right. Uh, point three is really, uh, I mean, honestly, it leads right in and it's honesty. Huh. Um, in order to have sex, health it requires open and direct communication with oneself and every sexual partner so honesty with yourself uh, requires being open to sexual pleasure it requires being open to sexual experience and sexual education right like you cannot have sexual relationships uh without like Without honesty, sexual relationships can't be like have effective communication and you can't have healthy sex. Right. So that honesty is absolutely critical. And and if you think about it, you know, one of the things we haven't gotten to yet, but one of the sexual principles, it's actually number six is pleasure. Like if you're not honest with each other, how do you really experience pleasure? pleasure to its fullest right like because how do you figure out what you like and what you don't like and and what things you could like if that makes any sense just on a basic like curiosity level if that makes any if that clicks there um and so each person in the relationship has to have the responsibility um to determine their own standards of honesty about sex and sexuality um they have to be able to be open with their partners um medical providers themselves if that makes sense like you you really have to dig in and figure out what is what is being honest and and sometimes it might be being honest about a sexual desire that is that that maybe if you will hurtful to a partner but but by saying like hey I occasionally think about being sexual outside of our relationship. And I want to be honest that 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 thought comes up for me. And I know that it would be very harmful to you. And I don't want to go there. Right. Like, let's be honest about some of that or or, or a lot of that, if that makes sense, not to uh, manipulate or exploit or anything like that. But just to be like, look, I need to be honest with myself. Um there are times where I'll say, hey, I'm going to be honest with my friend about this issue um, and, and uh, so that I can work through it. Like, hey, friend, I've been having sexual thoughts about somebody and I don't feel like that would be good for my uh, relational agreement with, in my case, my wife. And so I want to talk about this. I need somebody to be honest with about this so that I can get get to the bottom of it or manage it better. And, and 
Well, Go I ahead. think you're, you're talking about like with a friend, like for a, a, a sex addict, a person in recovery, having a sponsor, having a qualified therapist. Oh, totally. Yeah, Cause the last thing you want to do is go, Hey, yeah, I was walking down the street and I want to go tell my partner, you know, I was thinking about, right. yeah. So the parameters why, of that. Yeah. I, I backed off because I said, you know, like if I'm in a healthy relationship and I don't have any betrayal, I could go to my typically go to my spouse and say, Hey, I'll be honest. I've been having a hard time lately. Some thoughts I don't want are coming up. They're kind of intrusive. Uh, and I just need somebody to open up to. And if I've got a good relationship with my sexual partner, like that might be a wonderful conversation to have, but too often. And I've talked about this in other videos. If I've betrayed my spouse and I'm and my spouse or, or partner is coming to me, well, you need to tell me everything, every fantasy, every thought, that's not always healthy because uh, there's there's too many times where it's like, well, now at this point, you hold the power. Um, I um, am trying to figure out recovery and you want me to tell you every fantasy. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing. Right. Let me reach out to my sponsor. Let me reach out to my other people in my support group and let me have a conversation about um these things that are coming up for me so that I can sort them out and figure out how to address them. Um, but I don't necessarily encourage, Hey, let's share with each other our fantasies or let's share with each other. Anytime a, a, a fantasy thought comes in my head because, because I don't want you to be upset, right? There's a certain level of, of fantasy thought that comes up. And then now the question is what's healthy for me to do with that. Do I dwell on it? Do I spin it around in my brain? Right. Or do I need to find another outlet for it? Right. Like uh, and, and at the same time, some, I've worked with some partners who feel like, well, if you have any fantasy, that's a slip. And it's like, sorry, that's not a slip. Like, it doesn't mean that they don't need to check it in with, you know, their support system. But I don't think you should be reporting that to a spouse. That's not typically a good thing. Yeah, Dr. Rob says the same. It's, you know, it's about actions, like absolutely middle circle behavior. And what do you need to do to get back into the outer circle? You know, the song that I, one of the songs I hate is the, that um, if you like pina coladas where they're both, you know, going to the, I, I hate that song. Like, like it makes it sound like, I, well, it's okay. Cause it's so funny. Cause we were both thinking about cheating. I hate it. You know? Oh, is that what the, I don't even know? Uh, yeah, if you like, I mean, uh, don't go look it up. Rupert Holmes. It's a horrible song, in my opinion. If you guys love that song, I'll be, you know, but yeah, it's yeah, like they put an ad. This is old. They put an ad in the thing and they're hooking up at the bar and it's my own lovely lady sitting at the bar. Ha ha ha. You know, so. Oh, you're too young, Matt. Sorry. Well, but no, anyway. I know the song, but I never paid enough attention to it. And I don't know why I thought it was Jimmy Buffett, but. No, that's um, Margaritaville. That's a whole nother. We're, we're, <laughs> that's a whole. That's a whole different song. You're right. A whole, whole different, different song. song. But no, now okay. that you mentioned it, I do think I know what you're talking about. So basically, a couple they both put an ad in and they find each other. One answer, were, yeah. One puts the ad in. One puts answers and ha ha ha. It's and yeah. I just you know it, yeah. anyway. That's me. Sorry, we we digress. So okay, we there's digress. a question. Yes. And the question at the end of the day is, how do I heal from this? So as a betrayed partner, it feels like sexual assault to me. I was tricked into marrying someone I would never have married. And their what their fundamentally was not consent in our sex because I was not informed 13 years of non-consensual consensual sex. I'm in therapy and support groups, but I don't know how to heal from this. So, yeah, well, um, how do I heal from this is the is the beautiful question there. Um, and, and sadly, uh, I don't have a simple answer. Um, I think you're in the process. Being in therapy certainly can help. Being in support groups certainly can help. Um, I think recognizing, um, I think recognizing that it feels like sexual assault to you, that it feels like you were tricked, um that it feels like there was a lack of consent i think all of those things are really healthy for you to recognize and you're going to need to work through each of those as you go along right like um and and i think part of it is so how do we move forward establishing these principles of sexual health and and so a lot of times it's hey let's have honesty move 
moving forward. Let's have, let's do these things moving forward because this is what we would have needed 13 years ago, for instance. Um, and so let's start practicing and learning how to do these things now. I also think one of the things you have to figure out is, do you want to stay in the relationship? Um, right? Like you've got to figure out, do I want to stay? Because you were tricked into it. Part of your healing is probably going to be you learning to make the choice. I I was tricked into it. It felt like assault. It felt like um, a lack of consent. But now I choose. Now I give my, my consent. If you're begrudgingly moving along in the process, like, well, I got tricked, and you're not resolving that I still, I have a choice. I could leave and currently I choose to stay. I want you, I would encourage you to own that you have the choice to consent now. And that, I think there's a lot of healing in that, in that, that I could leave. I could leave any moment. I've had people tell me, I don't understand why it's healthy to, uh, to basically believe that divorce would be okay. And because maybe they have like a religious feeling that like divorce isn't okay or whatever. And I tell people, I think having divorce as an option in your mind gives you the freedom to fully choose to stay. I, I could divorce. I know I could, but I choose to stay. And that choice can be very healing. So you might need to spend some time figuring out how you are choosing and why you are choosing to stay, even though this terrible thing happened to you. Um, but it, and then it's figuring out, well, what are the other ways? So for instance, if you're going to engage sexually, which for your health, I hope you are like, I hope you're enjoying that. Um, because I think it's a really valuable part of our lives. And so um and and we can get into that uh you know maybe later today but in another time um but you if you basically say i now know the information and that's the other thing sometimes people and and i'm leaning a little bit more away i think disclosures can be really valuable but i also am realizing they can cause a lot of damage in some sense as well um and and it all depends on the person some people can hear all the details and get a solid disclosure that's done really, really therapeutically well and finish off with a disclosure and go that was wonderful that really helped me and other people will get the same disclosure that's done really well and very well prepared and feel mentally scarred and it's a hard thing because i can't tell a client what the outcome is going to look like but i warn them that hey this could come out being really painful and and this may create some emotional and mental scars so even that you want to consent to a disclosure right like i i'm not doing it because my therapist says that that's how they've been trained i'm doing it because i choose to do it and that's where i'm going to push you how are you going to heal from this um seek to understand all the things you're consenting to and consent to them with your full as best you can with your full knowledge and your full choice i i think it's really important that even when your therapist in, encourages you to do something your therapist has a power differential over you your therapist um because you look to them as an authority holds a power differential and I've, the older I've become and the longer I've been in this profession, the more I've become nervous about my power differential because I don't want to say something to a client that makes them think, oh, well, I really trust Matt and he uh, cares for my well being. I'm going to do this thing that he says I should do. Um, I've learned a lot of lessons over the years realizing uh, that, that each one of us has to um work on consent regardless of who's encouraging us to do something so i may really trust my therapist but even my therapist may not know and understand all of the circumstances so i teach my clients do not consent to any part of treatment because you trust me um do it because you 
understand or and if you don't understand ask me let's talk about the pros let's talk about the cons let's talk about the potential risks and benefits to any form of treatment uh, and i and so i think it's really important for us as patients as clients of a therapist to do the same thing with our therapist so how do you heal my huge suggestion to you would be um Focus on practicing consent in every aspect of your life. It is very empowering. And it, and don't become exploitative in your behavior in return. Um, so trying to avoid being exploitative on your end is really important. Practice consent in all of your relationships and consent that goes both ways. Every once in a while, I'll see a betrayed partner who, who might take it to the extreme where they feel abused and powerless. So then they swing to the other side and in a sense, without realizing it, might become abusive and overbearing in their power because they don't want to feel powerless again. And I think the healthiest relationships are where consent is going back and forth in both directions. Uh, so we have to be very careful, even in a betrayed or addict situation that there's consent going both ways that even the addict isn't being non-consensual to try and appease their partner fine let me tell you all these details let me let me confess every fantasy in my head no that's not consent that's non-consensual because it may not be healthy for them so that's a lot of answer. I hope it's helpful. It is, but they said very insightful. And I, I, I keep a quote over here. You, you said earlier uh, about divorce, but in order to have the choice to stay, you have to know that you can leave. And, and to me, yes. that's like I have consent. So, so I think that that's a really powerful uh, thing. And what I hear with this is so much grief. And I would really encourage you to work um, uh, through the grieving process, which will take time. Um, but right. yeah, the it, you know the anger at that that this you know this relationship wasn't as it was supposed to anger that your partner you know lied to you and manipulated things so so all of those things would be grief work you know to consider as you know in addition to what you know matt was sharing last questions uh, we've got just in a couple minutes what is the psychology this is a really probably a big question what is the psychology behind men who fantasize about sharing their partner it feels so backwards um so there is no way that I could answer this. Um, I mean, in some in some respect, we could spend a whole hour on this and I'm still not going to answer it, right? One, I'll be honest, I'm not an expert in even um, uh, kink, which is probably what this would fall into. Um, if anybody is interested, I don't, I haven't read it myself, but like Stephanie Gorlich, uh, has a book about, uh, it's called with sprinkles on top and it introduces kink into where one couple wants kink or one person wants kink and the other partner is vanilla and it's very kink affirming. Um, because, but I, I don't actually think that that's what you're wanting from me, but what, but what I'm going to tell you is, uh, it, I can see why it feels backwards to you because it's not in your arousal template. And, and so um, where, what I will say is that men who fantasize about sharing their partner or even a woman who fantasizes about sharing their partner, there's so many possibilities. I'll just give you a couple. So let's say, and this is, I mean, there, 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 and, and there's so many nuances, there's just no way for me to get into it. But so let's say there's a man who fantasizes about sharing his partner. And for him, it's I'm going to share my partner, but then she's coming home with me. And so for him, he's like, she's mine and she chooses me, even though she just had sex with this other person, male or female, it doesn't matter. And I can be there and I might even be able to participate but it's really arousing and exciting to know that she chooses me and continues to come home with me, even though she's being sexual with somebody else in this way. And so it's this idea in that regard of 
I'm so valuable and important that she could go and be with so many other people, but she continues to come back and want to be with me. And that is super fulfilling emotionally and sexually. Uh, so that's one reason. And to be honest with you, like I said, there's books that have probably been written about this and I haven't written them. Um, so that might be one reason. Um, another reason, and this, this one is actually, I'll give you another example. Like I've worked with a lot of individuals who might watch pornography, for instance, of like, let's say, let's say you have a man who watches pornography of two women being sexual together. And a lot of times they'll tell me, oh, I'm watching lesbian porn. And, and I'm like, are you in your mind? Why are they doing that? Right. Like in your fantasy, why are they doing that? And I'll, and what I'll often hear is, well, they're doing it to make me aroused. Like they're doing it to excite me. And I'll say to you, OK, is it possible that two women who, who are lesbian would be having sex to arouse a man? Not likely. Sure, it's possible. Anything's possible, if that makes sense. And so then you're not watching lesbian porn. You're watching pornography of two women who in your fantasy are doing it to arouse you right and so then if you look at that you might have somebody who says i'm going to share my partner but in in this case he or she my partner is only doing it to arouse me so they're going to have sex with somebody else so that i get aroused and it could be that they enjoy being teased it could be that they enjoy um, potentially voyeurism. Like voyeurism. It could be mm -hmm. humiliation. It could mm -hmm. be, I mean, there's so many facets. There is no way for me to explain, nor would I even tell you, I can appreciate to you it feels backwards. To them, it doesn't feel backwards. To them, it feels fulfilling. But I, I don't blame you for feeling like, well, that's backwards. If my partner really loves me, why would they want to share me with anybody? Why would they want me just for me? And, and it's like, I get it. And I'm not going to trivialize it. But in their brain, like they've created reasons why. So I hope that's helpful for, for. It's a complex, like I read it. I was like the whole psychology. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's a zillion, there's a different, and, you know, and. And kind of the why is, you know, if it's problematic for the for the relationship, I mean, if everybody's in agreement, you know, rock on. But but when people are not in agreement with that, you know, then then that's the relationship, you know, issue. And and going back to consent, you know, and yeah, that, like, yeah, that would feel coercive if I was not, you know, a willing partner in that. So that's um, where I go back to what is your relational agreement? And if the two of you are okay with it, then how can I help? Like what, what do you, you know, if we sit and talk about it, but you don't need help with it, then what, do, you know, why am I here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so like, it's, it sounds funny, but it's like with every person, every couple I'm working with, it's, if it's problematic, why? And how can I help you guys through it? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I can totally appreciate somebody looking at that going, that feels so backwards, but there's lots of things that feel backwards. You might look at somebody who's attracted to their same gender or to, um, you know, a trans person or whatever. And, and you're like, well, that feels backwards. OK, like and, and I love that you're asking the question. You're curious. I want to have more understanding, probably more compassion, more empathy for somebody instead of judging them. So I love that you asked the question and I hope it gives you the ability to empathize and have more compassion without judgment. Because if it's your partner, for instance, then you can talk and have a conversation about it, even though you may never agree to that agreement, which is fine. But uh, you probably have heard of this often. I hear this often where partners go, I did behaviors that I didn't really consent to because they really, really, you know, basically push. So it goes right back to the same thing that you said about consent. If there's not manipulation or, or coercion and you're a willing participant, truly, you know, um, but often, it, it, you know, especially when there's, you know, addiction issues, it crosses that line. So totally. but great. Question, we, yeah, great question. Great questions all the way around. So we'll look forward to part two next time. 
you know, we know what you're going to be starting with. So, <laughs> so thanks everyone. Thanks, Matt. Bye. Uh, Tammy, you're amazing. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye.